Well, if you have the Lord's Word, if you'll turn with me to 1 John, 1 John chapter 1. The letters of John are right before the book of Revelation, so you should be able to find it pretty easily. First John chapter 1, we'll be looking, we're going to just do verses 1 through 4 tonight. Maybe. Not like that, maybe. John, the aged apostle by this time, as we talked about last week in the introduction, John is probably well up in his 80s at this point. If you think he was a young man when Jesus was on the face of the earth, we're talking about around probably somewhere to between A.D. 90 and A.D. 100. So Jesus was born in 4 B.C. John might have been just a little bit younger than him, but probably not too much. So you figure John's getting on up there. He might have even been in his 90s when he wrote these, these words. But he's still in love with Jesus, and I think that's going to come through very clearly uh, in the words that he writes in this, uh, these letters. Notice in verse 1, "...that which was from the beginning..." which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen, and heard, we proclaim also to you. So that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Have you ever noticed uh, Hallmark cards? the way they present the family. They do a great job at uh, painting these holiday scenes with family members gathered around a a full table. Uh, You know, just everybody seems to be happy and joyful. Well, have you ever noticed real life's not like that? Uh, And even if it were exactly like what they paint on those Hallmark cards, it would still not be a really good portrayal of the fellowship that exists between believers in Christ. Because God is essential to relationships that are fulfilling. Uh, That relationship that you and I enjoy with God only comes through Jesus Christ. And no human relationship can be what that relationship is uh, with Jesus Christ. So fellowship, as you talk about that word fellowship, uh, fellowship is then not a religious word, but it's part of the fabric of human society. So breaking fellowship with one another is one of the highest sins or one of the sins of the highest order because it disrupts God's creative designs for full and meaningful human lives. The key to these relationships comes from the word of life. And that's who John begins to talk about here in this particular passage of Scripture. Notice, first of all, God's word is the eternal word. It is the eternal word. Uh, Notice where John says, that which was from the beginning. You know, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, it says, in Literally, in beginning, the is missing out of there. It's in the English version, but it's not in the Hebrew Bible. In beginning, God. So when you go back to the very beginning of time, and even beyond time, the one ultimate reality for all of us is God. And what John is going to tell us, and he's got a reason for this that we'll explore in just a minute, but what John is going to point out to us is that eternal life is actually Jesus Christ. And we know from other scriptures that it was uh, God's spoken word that was carried out through Jesus Christ because Jesus, all things were created by Him. 
And without Him was not anything made that was made, is what Paul tells us over in Colossians. So John opened his particular letter by claiming the Word was from the beginning. If you can just flip over really quick in your Bible, go to the Gospel of John in chapter 1. See if this sounds familiar. In John chapter 1, he starts off the gospel by saying, In the beginning, does that sound familiar? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And so in the beginning, uh, John made this astounding claim about Jesus Christ. That Jesus was actually with God in the beginning. Jesus' own creative power was essential to the creation event. Now why was that so important? Well, if you remember last week when we were talking about the introduction, uh, there was a group of people called Gnostics. They didn't really come into full-blown. Their theology didn't become really fully established until about 150 A.D., So this would have been about 50 years before that. But the beginning points of this particular doctrine was really part of Greek philosophy during that day and time. And so it was literally coming out in some of the false teachers, this particular church, these particular people that John was writing to, or having to deal with false teachers and false prophets. And one of the things that they were teaching was that Jesus wasn't really real. Or they were teaching he was only human, one of the two things. The ones who said that Jesus was only human, they said the Christ Spirit came upon Jesus at his baptism and left before he was crucified on the cross. For those who said Jesus uh, just appeared to be human, they had really discounted all the cross Because if Jesus wasn't really real, then he really didn't suffer on the cross, did he? And of course, without him suffering on the cross, you and I can't have salvation. We can't be saved. It was necessary for Jesus to experience that. And so John, in the very beginning, he actually starts off this particular letter with a bunch of relative pronouns, which is really unusual because there's no verb in the first few verses. Notice that which we've had from the beginning, that's which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, which we touch with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was, there's the first verb, was made manifest. So the very first part of this, John is really hitting head on the false teachers and the false teaching that was going on. For John, the word, if you go to the Gospel of John in John 1.14... After saying that Jesus was with God in the beginning and the Word was God, he goes on to say in John 1, 14, the Word became flesh. He didn't just appear to be flesh. He actually became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. And so for John, one of the things that he wanted to clarify for these believers up front is that Jesus really came in the flesh. And in Him, as it says here, He is life. These things our hands have touched concerning the Word of life. And so for John, Jesus was the true life. He was the life that enlightens every man. Jesus came into this world. Uh, So John's theology is that the reality of one God and His creation is an essential place to start for any sound biblical theology. And of course, John's focus is not just on God the Father, but primarily on God the Son and who He is and what He came to do. The clear biblical teaching about creation is that this material world is good. You remember what God said back in Genesis when He created the world? He beheld, and after the first day, he said, Behold, he looked at everything, and he saw that it was good. And of course, when he created mankind, he said, Behold, it was very good. He added an adjective in there. So for God, everything was good. Now, these false teachers that were teaching the church and leading, evidently leading some of these believers astray, 
they were, they were, as I said, had these Gnostic tendencies. It wasn't a full-blown full theology at this point, but they were the beginning points of this theology. And Greek philosophy a lot, had a lot to do and a lot, a lot of influence into what this doctrine and this teaching, this false teaching was. Because for them, the world, material world, was evil. It was tied up, and, and you know, people today still think this. If God is God and God is good, then why, why do we have to deal with all the suffering all the time? Why doesn't God put an end to it? Why doesn't God stop it? And so the idea was because things in this world are not good and because of suffering in this world, this world is actually evil. And so for them, there's no way that God, being a good God and being a spirit, spirit is good, matters evil, so God who is good would never create something that was evil. So how did the world get here? Well, they had this idea that there was a demiurge. Now, that's a really fancy word that they used. Uh, I'm trying to think of maybe a... Well, I, I think a, maybe an illustration might help. Have you ever had a dog that you've given a bath to? What is the first thing that dog does after you, you get him out of the bath? He shakes. And you get water going everywhere, Right? Well, this idea of a demiurge is that you have deity up there in the sky somewhere, up in heaven, wherever that is. They, I don't know that they actually said. But it's like this good God is spinning and, and, and part of Him is spinning. And as He spins, part of Him like a dog gets shaken off. And then that continues to spin and part of that gets shaken off. And, and then that continues to spin and part of that gets shaken off till you get to the very end of it. And what happens is you finally get a deity that's far enough away from God that he's no longer good and he can create matter which is evil. That's the way they explained it. And what the Bible plainly teaches us is that God created all matter. He created time and space. He created everything good. This world is not evil. This world is good. Now, sin has marred this world. Sin has infected this world, and so we have to deal with that. But God, when He created everything, He created everything as being good. And so what John would say is, that which was from the beginning is the same thing what we have heard. This God, this Jesus, came to earth. We heard Him with our own ears. Uh, we've seen Him with our own eyes. We've looked upon, we've gazed at Him, we've listened to Him teach. We've paid attention to Him. That's what He's trying to say there. And then He says, we have literally touched Him with our hands. Now, if He would have been a spirit, not actually God, you would not have been able to touch Him, right? If you just stuck your hand on Him, it would have gone all the way through Him if He'd have been spirit. But Jesus was not spirit. He was God come in human flesh. And so John hammered the truth about creation in the very first verse of this letter. John was hitting a major problem from head on because he didn't want to give any place to the teaching of these false teachers. John's opening verse presents a complex combination of four relative pronouns that literally function as direct objects. But what he wrote about was the life. And that life was eternal life. Jesus has always existed in the eons of time. He was with God in the beginning. We believe, as Christians, we believe in a triune God. We believe Scripture teaches us there is a triune God. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, and there's God the Holy Spirit. They're one, and yet they're three. And we have a hard time, because of our human limitations, really grasping what that means. What the Trinity or triune, I like the word triune God because Trinity sounds like three. And it is, but it's the great three in one. So I prefer triune. You'll oftentimes hear me refer to it that way. is because God is one. That's one of the premier, if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Every Jewish person, every Jewish male, every day say Deuteronomy 6 4. Lord our God is one God. And that's their belief. And that's our belief. We believe there's only one God. But it's the triune God. They're all three deity. And they're all three God. And we need to remember that. 
So John hits that pretty hard at the very beginning. But what he wants us to understand is that word, that eternal word of God, has been incarnated. He has literally become, and the word incarnate literally means enfleshment. It means to be made flesh. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, actually. So the eternal word became the incarnate word. So this, this life uh, of Jesus Christ is divine and crucial to what makes Jesus so different than any other religious figure. Because Jesus was literally the God-man. Okay, He's not just a man. Jesus did not give up His deity. He gave up His privileges as deity. He gave up the splendor, if you will, of heaven, of being there in the presence of, of His Father, visibly, however that functions in the spirit world. We don't really understand and know all that. But Jesus did not cease to be God. That's why He knew what was in the heart of man. That's why He taught like nobody else taught. That's why He was able to lay hands on people and heal them. That's why He was able to bring people back from the dead, because He was life. He was the eternal life. But He was the life, the eternal life, that became a human being. So the life was made manifest, in verse 2 John says, and we've seen it, and we testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest unto us. John and the rest of the apostles had heard and seen Jesus. They had interacted with Him. And they had literally walked with Him while He was on this earth for about two and a half to three years. They'd witnessed His miracles. They'd listened to His teaching. And the word apostles that they were, Jesus called them and sent them as apostles means literally somebody who sent out on a mission. And their mission was to testify to who Jesus Christ is. Guess what? Our mission is the same thing, isn't it? Aren't we to go and to testify to Jesus who's literally changed our lives? We're to share with others that He can change their life as well. And so John and the apostles were giving testimony because they had literally seen Jesus. And, and underlying this whole thing, just think about it. If you're the standpoint, if you're a, a young believer and you're a member of this church that John is writing to, and the arguments of these false teachers seem to be logical as a Gentile person, as a Greek-speaking person. Uh, the worldview of the day was more in line with what the false teaching was, was going on than, than it was with biblical Christianity. Would it not be tempting to go the way of the false teaching and leave Christ? And so what John is trying to do is to help these young believers as well as confront the false teachers and tell them we're testifying to something that we have personally experienced. We're not telling you a fable. We're not making this stuff up. Uh, and, and the implication is this. For the false teachers, it was almost like John is saying, were you there with Jesus? We were. Did you hear His words? We did. Did you touch Him with your hands? We did. And so, for what John is trying to help these Christians do, now you're, you're under understand, this is 70 years after Jesus has gone back to heaven, after He's died. So, it's 60 to 70 years after Jesus Christ has departed. And the church, the early church, you go back and you study church history, the early church, the two things that they had to deal with that, that really cost them dearly in the first centuries of the church was false doctrine and persecution. Up until the time that Christianity was declared the official religion of the Roman Empire, which was in 312 or 313 B.C., up until that point in time, Christians were persecuted. Many of them gave their lives for what they believed. And so what John was saying is, you young whippersnappers that are talking about this stuff that you don't know about, you weren't there when Jesus was on the earth. We were. And we're giving testimony to you that this eternal Word was with the Father. 
was also made manifest to us that that which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we have the eternal Word that becomes the incarnate Word that then becomes the life-giving Word. In Him was life. He was the giver of life. That life was the light of men. Those who put their faith and trust in Him could experience this fellowship with God, fellowship with Jesus, as well as fellowship with their brothers and sisters in Christ. Now what what John is going to do is to use that argument of the false teachers do do not promote fellowship among believers in Christ. In fact, they destroy the very fellowship that Jesus came to establish. So John is beginning to set up his arguments as he's going through the introduction here by talking about the great Word, the Word that became flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word is simply another name for Jesus. And so we see this life-giving Word. Notice in John chapter 1, uh, verse 2, this life was made manifest, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was in the Father and was manifest to us. Jesus is the eternal life. You know, everybody wants to have an eternal life, don't they? Everybody wants to have a life worth living. You remember the story, the Christmas story, It's a Wonderful Life. How many of y'all saw that during Christmas? Anybody? Yeah, we didn't watch it this year, but we oftentimes do. But you know, the, the story is uh, George Bailey, uh, who has an angel to, from heaven, he tries to kill himself, and he has an angel from heaven that comes and reveals to him just how important his life really is. And and after he's, that's made clear to him, after his eyes have been opened, uh, he uh, goes about for joy proclaiming and declaring and testifying uh, to the, how great uh, things were. Saying Merry Christmas to everybody it was a great time of joy. Well, we've seen with our eyes and declare and testify to you uh, good news. And the good news is this, Jesus Christ was God in human flesh. That life that was revealed to us was eternal life. And in John, the idea of eternal life is not so much a period of time as it is an essence of life. Jesus said in John's gospel, or John said it, Jesus made this affirmation. He says, I've come to give you abundant life. Uh, Jesus prayed this, or in his uh, high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, he prays, uh, Lord, I want them to experience eternal life. And this eternal life is in the Father and in the Son. This is eternal life, Jesus said, that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou has sent. And so this eternal life is a quality of existence more so than a quantity of time. And the point that John is making here is that, that uh, concept of eternal life provides us with a relationship. It provides us with a relationship with God as well as a relationship with one another. If you want a wonderful life, look no further than Jesus. He is the source of true life for all humans. And for those who have accepted Him, they come in a new relationship with Jesus Christ, but also with other believers. So we see the incarnate Word. We see, first of all, the eternal Word that became the incarnate Word which is the life-giving Word. He's the one that gives life, eternal life to others. But not only that, He is the declared Word. Because that which we have seen, we proclaim to you. And then He says, we are writing these things to you. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So that which we've seen and that which we've heard uh, focuses on the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the fact that they personally interacted with Him this is an emphasis, these, uh, the tenses of verb that John uses in this particular verse really emphasize the ongoing consequences of the past action of the incarnation. Greek has this tense, perfect tense in Greek, 
is one of these things that there is a past event that happens that has ongoing results into the future. This life-giving Messiah, this Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal life that He gives, how long does it last? For all eternity, right? It continues on. And so this life that Jesus came and He provided through His incarnation uh, has continuing results even into the future. It impacts all of humanity. That's why the apostles had the responsibility to declare it, this eternal life, this life in Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world so that they too could enjoy the fellowship with God. So John countered the false claims of his opponents with authoritative teaching. John says, what we have seen and what we've heard, we declare to you. As apostles, they had the right from God to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, that which is true. One is reminded, as you think about this particular passage, that Paul, in Acts 20, 29, when he met with the Ephesian elders, you remember John was at this time the pastor of the church at Ephesus, uh, and so he's writing to his beloved flock. By this time, he probably is stuck at home and can't do a whole lot. But he's writing to his beloved flock to protect them against the false teachers that are coming his way. And I'm reminded of the time that Paul, when he, he's on the way to Jerusalem, and he knows he's going to be arrested and put in prison. And he calls the Ephesian elders to him. And he tells them, Give watch over the flock, because when I'm gone, there's going to be wolves that are going to come in, and they're not going to spare the flock. So the danger of false teachers that Paul had knew was coming, John is now experiencing, and the church is now experiencing. So how do you deal, and how do you address false teaching? With the declared Word of God. Guys, we don't have to make up our own arguments. We don't have to stand on our own, you know, our own abilities, or our own intelligence to try to deal with false teachers. We simply declare to them the Word of God. The truth is, Jesus Christ was with the God in the beginning and all eternity, in eternity past. He was born as a baby in a manger. He actually became a human being. And He went to the cross and died. And paid the penalty of our sins so that we might be put back into a right relationship with God. Christianity is relational. I tried to talk about that this morning. I kind of ran through it in a hurry. But Christianity is relational. We have a relationship with one another. And so John is trying to help them understand that they too could have this relationship with God. And that's what you and I need to do is to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles generated communities in fellowship with God and others through Jesus Christ, as he says here, so that you can have fellowship with us. Isn't it great when somebody gets saved? People maybe that have been attending church for a while and they still feel like an outsider, but then when they get saved, they become an insider, don't they? And they become part of our family. And we get to love on them and they get to love on us and there is a relationship that exists between members. That's one reason why I have a hard time when somebody has some, you know, somebody gets their feelings hurt or somebody doesn't like something that's going on in the church and they run over to a different church. I mean, how do you just walk away from your family? It just doesn't make sense to me, but it happens all the time. Uh, so the fellowship is divine in its origin, it's supernatural in its character, and it's available only in Jesus Christ. In 1 John, the Son of God imparts this godly fellowship into human experience. And, or as John says here, the fellowship that we have is with God and with His Son and with each other. This eternal life appeared. Jesus Christ, had He not gone to the cross and sacrificed Himself, you and I would not have fellowship with one another. We wouldn't even be here today. If Jesus hadn't come to this earth and died, we would still be lost in our sins we might be at a bar. I probably would be dead because I'm sure I would have made some really bad choices in my life. Many of us probably would, given the opportunity. But God has graciously and miraculously forgiven our sins and reconciled us. Jesus has reconciled us to God so that we can have fellowship with Jesus, we can have fellowship with the Father, and we can have fellowship one 
with another. And notice the last thing about this word. It's not only the eternal word and the incarnational word and the word of life. And it's not only the proclaimed word, but it's also the written word. Notice the last thing he says here. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. We know from 2 Peter verse, chapter 1, verses 20-21, through 21, Peter says this, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from somebody's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along, or we would say inspired, by the Holy Spirit. People didn't just sit down and take a pen in hand and start writing these words that we read in this Bible. God inspired, literally God breathed into these words life. And so you and I, when we share God's word, that's why it's like a two-edged sword that cuts to the very depths of a person's being. It's because these words are spirit-infused. They are divinely inspired. And you and I can... Speak about who God is. And the reason for the written word is so that our joy may be complete. Let me ask you something. Does it bring joy to your heart when you open God's word and read it? How much joy do you think we would have given the circumstances, even just these last couple of months, the circumstances that we've been in, how much joy would you and I have if we didn't have God's Word to bring us comfort during times like these? I know the Holy Spirit's with us. I know the Holy Spirit brings us comfort. But does it not bring comfort to your heart? Does it not bring joy to your soul to know what God's Word says when we go through times of difficulty? It does me. God's written Word is designed to help us to have joy. Uh, John wanted to speak joy into his the community to whom he was writing. No doubt these Christians were really struggling with these false teachers and false teaching. Have you ever noticed something? False teaching almost always attracts our heart. It's like Satan knows how to to, to pull us off the right path. It's like he knows how to get our attention. I, I think part of it is because False teaching oftentimes is logical. It appeals to our intellect. And that's exactly what this particular teaching did. Because the word Gnostic literally comes from the Greek word knowledge. And for the Gnostics, not now, not at this point in stage that John is writing, but when Gnosticism is full-blown in about A.D. 150, salvation is not about having a personal relationship and accepting the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for your sins. Salvation had to do with knowing The more you knew, the more saved you were. Goes back to works again versus a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So John is writing these words and the rest of scriptures are written for us to bring joy to our hearts even as we're going through times of difficulty. And I'm so thankful for the Lord. So as we we begin this study and we think about John, think about this word. This eternal Word that became a living Word. And in Him was life, and that life was the light of men. And because He became a human being, He was able to go to the cross and pay the penalty of our sins so that you and I might be forgiven and so that we might be brought into fellowship with God and with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit in our life when you and I are born again. I'm so thankful for God. I'm so thankful for this word that is a declared word. It's been declared to us through the apostles and written down for all the ages so that you and I might have joy. Let's pray together.